me. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello and welcome to the BRICS Youth Talks. I'm Zhao Ying in Beijing. Today I will be joined by six young people. Five of them are from BRICS countries and one is from a BRICS plus country. So we're going to look at the future of this block from a youth perspective. While young people undoubtedly play a crucial role in these countries, which account for 40% of the global population and a quarter of the global GDP. However, this year's BRICS summit is taking place when emerging economies are coping with an increasingly volatile world. The uh, COVID pandemic, the uh, economic recession, as well as the geopolitical instabilities are all having huge impact on people's lives and hitting young people the hardest, perhaps. So today we're going to discuss the challenges that young people are facing and we'll see what we can do in this time of uncertainty. But first, let's meet our guests. So first of all, from Brazil, we have Giovanni Sintra. You are a software developer, content creator, and martial arts enthusiast. Wow, hello, our, uh, Giovanni. Can you tell us more about yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Giovanni. I come from Brazil. And I already have experimented with uh, lots of professional fields. I have a bachelor degree in advertisement and most of my working life, I work as a software developer, right? And then in this meantime, I, I practiced Chinese martial arts for about 20 years, which made me open my own uh, martial arts uh, studio in Brazil. And then this passion also brought me to China uh, four years ago to uh, do my master's degree. And I just decided to stay here. And now I work here as a translator. So. Wow, great. That's basically it. Thanks for joining. Okay, so from Russia, we have Artem Zhdanov. So Artem, can you tell us more about yourself? Hello, I'm Artem. I've been living in China for over 10 years. Uh, originally, I'm from Russian Siberia, so from Asian part of Russia. Uh, I'm co-owner of a digital marketing agency, so we help foreign brands to enter the Chinese market and help them to understand Chinese e-commerce and internet. As the same, we help Chinese brands to go abroad. And also, I'm a founder of Russian media outlets, uh, the biggest Russian media outlet about China. So we help Russian people to understand China more. So yeah, we hope to hear more of your stories and countries. your company stories uh, in our discussion. Uh, but now let's meet um, Amartya Gautam from India. Amartya, hello. Yeah, hi guys, uh, I'm Amartya from India. And uh, I've been in China for, I think, more than four years it's been now. I first came here just with a backpack and just to travel. And since then I stayed on. First I stayed on to study Chinese at the Chonggo and Mindashwe. And then I worked in a fintech startup, investing in overseas markets. And uh, since a couple of years, I've been working at Xiaomi, leading product strategy in a startups division for internet business. Um, yeah, in my free time, I also like to consult with investors uh, interested in the Indian tech scene. Uh, I also love music and I sing in a bunch of languages, more than 10 languages, including uh, Chinese, wow. Russian, and Spanish. Yeah. Okay, thank you, so thank you, you started, for inviting us. Thank you. So you started as a backpacker, but I know that there's another guest here today who also started as a backpacker in China and then decided to study here, Joaquin from Argentina. Can you tell us more about your experience? Yeah, I did. It was a similar experience. I got a Confucius Institute scholarship for a summer camp, and then I traveled around China was my, my first experience in China. Afterwards, I decided to do my master's degree in Xinan, uh, Xinan Jiaodong Daxue in Chengdu. And currently, I'm doing my research. Uh, I research about uh, foreigners' perceptions about Chinese mobile applications, and also I do some research about international relations. Thank mm. you. Yes, but can you tell us where you are now? Well, currently, I'm in a village. Uh, I'm shooting a documentary with CGDM in the north part of Sichuan. Uh, we are doing a documentary about uh, the condition of the villagers and basically uh, economic development and rural economic and ethnic areas. And so, yeah, basically, I'm in the villagers' leader's house 
Wow. That he has a Wi-Fi here. So yeah, uh, we are yes, doing this. Please this kind say, of... say thank you to the village leader for the Wi-Fi in will. the room. <laughs> and you, you have to leave early, uh, right, for the shooting. Indeed, indeed, yes, because I'm taking time from the shooting team. OK, so, well, yeah. we'll let you go early on in a while. Thank okay. you. So also, we have Chen Xi from China. She's joining us from Shanghai. Hello, Chen Xi. Hi, uh, my name is Chen Xi, and I'm currently uh, a PhD candidate at East China Normal University in Shanghai. So I'm doing Asia Pacific studies, analyzing the uh, regional as well as the global trends and challenges facing the Asia Pacific region. So as we all know, that uh, youth represents the momentum of our time. So I feel quite uh, privileged to engage in today's youth talk and discuss with our friends from BRICS about our shared future. OK, so from South Africa, we have Rion van der Melbe. You are a director for stakeholder relations at the South African BRICS Youth Association. So you're an expert in BRICS, actually. <laughs> I mean, not say an expert, but I think, I think we try. Uh, morning, everyone. It's still morning here in South Africa. It's great to be with you today. Uh, yes, the South African BRICS Youth Association was established to create bridges between South African youth and youth within BRICS. So this space is very relevant uh, to our work. Uh, myself, I'm in between a civil society activist in South Africa and also in academia. Um, I went to China in 2019, had an opportunity to live in Shanghai for a while. And that's actually what inspired me later to pursue my master's in international relations, and uh, which led me into becoming involved with the South African British Youth Association. So it's, it's fantastic to be with you guys today. OK, thank you. We have a really strong panel today. So welcome to you all. And um, I'd like to start by asking each of you to share your understanding of the BRICS, or what do you hope that we can do um, under this framework? So um, Rion, shall, shall we start with you? Because you're from this association, so I guess you have more knowledge about this. I'll do that. I'll give it a go. Um, so I think for me, when we think for, of BRICS from an African perspective, so obviously South Africa became a member of BRICS in 2011, uh, so it's one of the most recent additions to the bloc, but our interest in the bloc is particularly in terms of creating a new type of international relations. Uh, I think when we look at the BRICS bloc, it's very experimental, uh, but it's also very exciting because there are many new opportunities for countries to work together. Uh, from a South African perspective, and I think many of the countries here as well, the international order and the international system, the way it is today, was created at a time when many of our countries were not free yet. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, uh, India, all these countries were still either colonies or somehow unable to, to uh, gain their independence at the time after the Second World War, when the current world order was established. And so things like BRICS and, and other international relations initiatives are trying to create a global order where we can promote diversity and inclusion um, and various perspectives on how humanity should govern itself on a global scale. So very much when we look at BRICS, it's not just about BRICS in the five countries, it's very much a vision for humanity going forward um, in how we wish to, to shape our own future. Yes, it is not an exclusive one. Actually, so um, I'd like to ask Joaquin, because Argentina is, is currently not a BRICS country, but it is one of the BRICS plus countries. And I heard that um, your country is actually looking to join the BRICS. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, because mm -hmm. you need the agreement of all the member states, right? But what do you think joining the BRICS would mean for Argentina? And do you think it can help your country solve your current problems? I think yes, because basically uh, the BRICS is just like an instrument, a platform to build like a more balanced international order. So this can enhance the cooperation and assistance between our countries and to have like more tools for the national economy of Argentina in order to solve our own problems. For example, some financial instruments such as the new development bank and the monetary reserve system and other cooperation systems in education, science, technology. So I think this can be like an engine for our economy to help solve our problems. Okay, so Giovanni, what about Brazil? Because 
Um, it looks like Brazil is a far away country from China, but you do have strong historical ties with African countries, right? So how do you think your country is being linked with the others uh, in this block? Well, um, I think Brazil, especially in the, the latest 20 years, was like a very big emerging economy, like not only through its uh, resources and like a big population, and uh, uh, being part of this this economic block just brings more independence, right? Like the the key word of the the whole BRICS block is like to bring this balance uh, in geopolitical influence, right? So uh, for Brazil, like to to be uh, to have an opportunity to be a little more independent from the uh, current global order is like the 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 best thing that, that we can have for now. Okay, okay, great. So, um, Artem, what about you? Um, what do you hope that we can do under this framework? Okay, I, I'm going to talk from like young people perspective. I think like the BRICS countries for sure have, uh, like young people have more common problems than for example, people in developed okay. countries. I mean, like, it's obvious that, like, young people in developed countries in U.S., in, like, European Union have totally different uh, problems than we have in BRICS. So I think that's why, like, we need to exchange uh, some countries doing better in one field, some countries doing better in another field. So it's an amazing platform to exchange our experience and solve problems together. Yes, we'll discuss the problems that young people are facing in these countries in a short while. Uh, but before that, let's hear from Armartia about your understanding of the BRICS. Yeah, actually, I think um, my friends here have covered uh, most of the points, so I agree with that. And I think one of the points that seems to be a common thread in what everyone is saying is that um, we have kind of moved on from the post-World War II order. You know, now we are entering a more multipolar world uh, with the need for more multilateral um, cooperation forums. So for this, I think uh, BRICS is a move in the right direction. And what, con but the thing is, I also feel that there has not been enough uh, concrete output from this. Uh, so I think we can also think more about what can be done and what are the blockers. Sure, sure. So let's get some per per perspective from China. So Chen Xi, what about you? Yeah, I do agree with our guests here that uh, uh, this kind of uh, BRICS mechanism provides a platform for young people as well as for countries to tackle with the problems that we are currently experiencing. So the, the, the BRICS mechanism actually, I think, is a very essential like uh, cooperation platform for especially emerging countries and uh, developing countries. So all these member nations, they actually have achieved during the you know past several years, especially in terms of their uh, economic development. I think the BRICS mechanism itself provides an opportunity for all countries of diverse economic structures, and they have different resources, and they can work together, and they can achieve effective cooperation. So what has made the uh, BRICS mechanism quite different compared with other agreements or the uh, union or other organizations is that I think that diversity as well as the uh, inclusiveness are the two important words. So by saying the diversity, because we know that all member countries countries, um, we have different kind of political systems and also different levels of economic development, as well as the talents from, you know, different social and cultural backgrounds. But with all these differences and diversities, we can work together and we can like explore different grounds, different fields to develop in different industries. So the BRICS, uh, the BRICS countries, they are now unlock the potential of cooperation. So among its member countries, but also it is a kind of the open network, as we know, the, uh, the, the BRICS uh, plus network. 
So this is not a kind of a, a closed circle with only several countries within, but this is an open network, the Bridge Plus network. So it expands the possibility of forming the alliances within or even across different continents. So through the trade and investment and other deals to, to develop together. So for me, I think this is not only a combination of, uh, of countries, but also a kind of combination, um, we can say hum uh, humanities, because it includes history, culture, even literature, etc. But together, all these countries, they represent the future, and also we can create a better future. Okay, very well said. So when we talk about what we as young people can do under this framework, I think it's kind of a hard topic in some way, because as we know, young people in many countries, they are struggling to find a job, or some are even losing their jobs. Uh, take the Chinese example, uh, the May uh, youth unemployment rent rate has hit record high, and the government said uh, the situation could get even worse as millions of fresh graduates are now looking for jobs. So Artem, just now you mentioned about um, the problems that young people are facing. So do you feel that people in Russia, young people, they are also faced with the same kind of pressure? Uh, Russia population is not that huge as Chinese. That's uh, that's why I mean, like we don't have, let's say, like the lack of jobs, but the problem of the like segmentation of jobs. You you know, like it's the problem. Like young people don't want to go to become engineers. It's not cool. We don't want to go to factories. It's not cool. So everyone try to be a lawyer. Everyone try to be a like marketing researcher, whatever. So, and these jobs, like for sure, they are limited, as, especially for emerging country. It's not like the country with a, like, you know, like high tech economy. We still need a lot of production. We still need a lot of industries uh, de to be developed, but young people don't want. They just looking on the example of developed countries and they say, oh, okay, I want to work in the office. I, I don't like, I, I want to be a freelancer, but our countries uh, like need really like, uh, more uh, industrial cases, I mean like post-industrial, I mean high-tech factories, whatever, but still it's production thing. So someone need to work on production of our own things because we don't want to be uh, depend on like foreign uh, brands on foreign, I mean like countries should produce something by themselves, right? I see. I think it's kind of similar similar situation in China that young people do not want to go to factories. I think we can discuss that a little bit deeper in a short while. But I want to first ask about uh, Joaquin, uh, what about the situation in Argentina? Because uh, your country is faced with uh, this, this debt issue. So I'm wondering how uh, young people are being affected by the economic situation in your country. Well, indeed. Uh... Although we are facing unemployment, we do not have, as Artem say, we do not have the same quantity of population as China or mm -hmm. India. So maybe Argentinian graduates looking for jobs may not be under the same human resource competition and pressure. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's true that fresh graduates are struggling more to get a decent job and entry level requirements are sometimes irrational. Uh, anyways, I think that the worst part maybe might not be for the fresh graduates. Uh, this is important to remark because uh, we had the opportunity to study. There are people who are facing other kind of situations, their future, those who didn't have the opportunity to study, they might uh, facing like very compromising situations and tied to lower, even lower income, lower weak labor conditions, so maybe we should focus on this kind of uh, people. But anyways, uh, it's true that in my country also, fresh graduates are dealing with these kind of situations. Okay, so uh, Giovanni, you're also from Latin America. What about the situation in Brazil? Brazil right now is facing a very complicated uh, structural problem in, in this part of uh, jobs. It's like, um, a very few part of the population uh, is actually graduated, has a, a bachelor degree, and uh, about like qualified jobs are they're they're a very small number. So we don't have much people actually working in qualified jobs or even having formal jobs. Like 
the 40 percent of the brazilian uh, active uh, economically active people are actually doing informal jobs which is like basically manual labor or like uh babysitting or these kind of like very simple jobs even though they this very small part of the population actually has some some bachelor degree and why is that is the problem with the um education system yes in one part is from the education system and the other part is from the the working laws in brazil because uh, the education system is actually it doesn't stimulate people to to study right uh, we have uh, some public schools which you can study for free but it has to be full-time and people cannot afford that like people that want to have like some free education have no they, they have still to work and and try to maintain their own houses or like to eat <laughs> to maintain the, the their their food right then uh private institutions are actually too expensive they are like three times the the average wage in brazil for, for our average brazilian worker so people cannot qualify themselves for these kind of jobs and the ones that can qualify not actually can have like a, a very good job Okay, I see. Um, so Chen Xi, I think it's a different situation here in China because in China, people can go to universities, but the thing is when they graduate, they are still having a hard time looking for a job. I mean, I, I guess you are not worried at all about your job because you're a PhD candidate, right? But um, any suggestions for those who are looking for jobs because we see that um, many people, they are pursuing uh, postgraduate studies or doctoral studies, not because they are interested in academics, but because they, they feel they can um, find a better job, being more competitive in the job market in this way. So we see that um, there's Peking University um, PhD graduate becoming a chengguan or urban management officer, or those uh, PhD from a top world top universities competing for a position in middle school. So I, I'm wondering how, how, how you think of this kind of situation. Yeah, well, we have been saying for quite a long time that the, the world today is undergoing major changes on seeing in a century. But the same thing applies to young people. I think young people now are facing the biggest or even the greatest change of, of, of our time, especially with the impact of the uh, pandemic. We are kind of changing our uh, views or outlook towards the whole world. So everything is, cha everything is changing now. So just as the, uh, the story I just mentioned, uh, a PhD graduate from big university, to uh, chooses to become a municipal urban officer or we say in Chinese. So usually people will hold the kind of uh, stereotype or the view that uh, certain works or occupations like uh, like these, they don't really require a, a PhD or even a master degree. But actually I think when we are thinking the, the phenomenon from the perspective of, of changing itself, then we can we can see that actually the nature of these positions is kind of uh, you know, increasing, increasingly changing at the same time because it reflects the kind of the career change or even the revolution in the future. Some of the work we used to hold the view that uh, it involves only high, you know, physical work and now it needs more intellectual content within. Because I have a friend who is doing the uh, landscape architecture design. So she told me that every time when they decide whether they will like to start a new program in a new city
by robots instead of waiters. So that involves high tech as well. So as the whole world as well as China is, are changing right now, so we have more young people to contribute to their knowledge and their experiences as well as their ideas. So for college students or graduates, even with a PhD degree, we have to say that we might take up an, you know, an occupation that is totally unpredictable or unexpected uh, before. And as young people, we have to face up too and also stand up, stand up to the challenges instead of just running away from the challenges themselves. Yes, yes. So Armartia, uh, what about the situation in India? Because I think very similar with China, Indian people are very hardworking and th their parents pay a lot of attention to their children's studies. So I'm wondering if you also have this kind of uh, somehow overeducated issue in your country. Yeah, I guess um, the uh, funnily enough, the Indian education is actually, I think, uh, the China Chinese do have some insight into this because our movies about the education system are quite popular here, right? Um, what what I'd like to highlight besides what um, my friends have said is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, we also discussed it once before in the India-China talk that um, I think there's a huge mismatch in our what our education system can provide and what, um, what the labor market needs. So what often happens is we spend a lot of time getting very highly educated and then what do you do with your degree? You're kind of stuck. So this is one problem that we have. I think it sounds similar to what uh, Artem was also saying. Um, and uh, the second problem is also our dreams and the realities because I think with uh, social media and this open internet, we kind of know, we, we can dream quite big. We can think of really, I mean, everyone has their own dreams, but we can think of a lot and we can dream to do a lot of things. But the reality is that it's quite hard uh, as a young person, even when you're highly educated to um, in practice, follow your dreams. Uh, these are two kind of um, overarching issues that I feel um, we're facing in India. And besides this, there are actually, I, now that I think about it, there's also a couple of things uh, or one thing in particular that BRICS could, it has already helped and I hope it will continue to help. Um, there's about, I think there's more than 20,000 Indian students light that they may be able to return to China to continue their studies. Yes. So I really hope that um, this, this spirit of BRICS can still continue to help these guys because um, this is a big deal, right? It's, it's young people, it's their futures at stake and they have invested in, um, in this kind of, uh, not just China, but in, uh, they've invested their futures here. So I hope that uh, following from this big summit also that things don't you know just kind of fall away i think i hope that they can actually come back complete their education and uh, follow their careers yes we do hope that things could go back to normal as soon as possible um so rion uh, what about south africa so uh, in south africa i think we have we could call unemployment um probably endemic at this point, uh, the average rate of unemployment for people below the age of 24 is, 60, is uh, 64%. And for those between the ages of uh, 25 and 34, it's uh, around 40%. So it's a very big problem. And I think I want to agree with what's been said around education and university education, and that kind of thing. In South Africa, the percentage of population that's in university is probably about 1% of the youth population. The rest are, are looking for work and are part of this unemployment demographic. And I think, to one extent, the, the problem of mismatch, as um, has been mentioned, the mismatch of skills is very relevant. But at the same time, and I think this might be true for some other British economies as well, is that the entire structure of our economy is not set up to be able to absorb these young people. For example, in South Africa, uh, we only came out of a segregated apartheid economy 25 years ago. So my generation is essentially the first generation living in the post-apartheid uh, era where the economy is now open to everyone. 
but for around 60 to 70 years while it was segregated, you had an a, a economy that was built for only a very small part of the population. And so even if in South Africa we did train people with relevant skills, the economy wouldn't be able to absorb them because there, there, are, there are just no employers. There's no one to actually employ them. Uh, so I think there the, the question of entrepreneurship and, and straight that becomes very important. And there's been some interesting work done within BRICS, particularly on that. Uh, the BRICS Business Council, for example, um, has a skill development working group. And they focus very much on trying to uh, tackle this problem and sort of promote entrepreneurship uh, as, as, as a sustainable solution. So I feel like that's also something that, that needs to be considered, which in BRICS, at least in South Africa, isn't being done enough. Yes, yes, since we all mentioned about this, this mismatch between the education system and the employment system. Um, so I think, um, actually, Artem, let me ask you, because just now you also said that um, Russians do not want to go to vac factories. Actually, there's an expert in China uh, who's suggesting that those college graduates who cannot find jobs, they should consider working in factories because they can at least feed themselves and do not need to rely on their parents. I don't know, what do you think about this suggestion? I mean, I'm not saying that manufacturing works or uh, going to factory is, is not good, but it's just that how much that you learn can be used in your work. But the thing is like most of these jobs, like factory workers or like a waiter, whatever, it's, uh, it's I mean, like, you don't need to ha have, a, like, a, your high degree, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. but you can promo get promotion by learning a lot of there. I mean, like, I know people. I have a really good Chinese friends he here who, like, uh, like, seven years ago, she started as a waiter. Then she became a general manager of restaurant. Now she opened her own restaurant. So it's possible. You don't need, like, high, like university degree. A lot of things, like you learn by practice even like my personal example before in russia we have a system when you need like five years to get kind of a bachelor degree then we switched it to like a world system when it was four years and that uh, changing process was right when i was studying and then i chose to finish like as soon as possible four years because i understand like i got a lot of theory and i need to go to China as soon as possible to get more practice. I don't uh, feel like I need like master's degree for now, for example, if I don't want to go to academy, whatever. Maybe when I will be 40, 45 years old and I will decide to like scale up my business or like my some studies, then I go to master's. You shouldn't go like right after the school, you go to university. Who made this rule? I don't know, like uh, you can go to try yourself somehow, like to factories, to whatever. I mean, like, even factories, it's, it's like, interesting. I worked before in, a, like, uh, help uh, Russian companies to produce things here on factories. Every industry is have a lot of things to grow. You learn it good. I mean, like, you're a good worker. They will promote you even without this diploma because his skills is more important. So I don't think, like, I, as uh, someone already said, that uh, the whole, this uh, high education system should be changed for sure. It's, like, already uh, out of date. Okay, so going to factory can also um, give you more experience and maybe pave the way for your future careers, right? So anyone has a different idea? Amartya, what about you? What do you think? Oh, I actually don't know much about this issue, so I don't want to say something Okay, on so this. Chen Xi, what do you think? Why do uh, yeah. young people do not want to go to factories? Well, uh, well, I do agree that uh, for, for, for different kinds of work or occupations, so one, one can learn. But especially for those who hold a PhD or master's degree, so their choices will uh, you know, influence the kind of in, have an impact on the, you know, the total development of the society. So, that is, so that's the reason why we, we are saying that the career planning would be very important. So the college education actually provides us with the basic knowledge or the kind of, um, kind of you know, the, the, the thing Thinking ways where um, you know how we can do things, but at the same time we have many kind of opportunities or chances um, in university or during the full times or even seven years time in university that uh, we can experience different different jobs and uh, occupations, and then we can we can make our you know final decisions which kind of work we would like to take for quite a long time. So as for the factory, uh, you know the, uh, the thing of working in factories, I think. 
that really depends on the nature of the position. So we have to take into consideration of different scenarios. So for one kind of scenarios would be for example, in China, we actually have a kind of surplus of uh, job seekers this year. So for many graduates, like the as uh, expert just uh, like mentioned, well, sometimes you know they graduate, they have to go to the factories for, for, for maybe several months or even one year or two years. But that is not the kind of the prevalence we have in the society. Because if you're going there just to oper just to, you know, operate the machines or become a assembly line workers, then a PhD degree or a master degree will definitely become a qualification. So this is kind of the short term or the short time phenomenon that we, we, we might see in our society, but not the kind of the prevalence or the kind of the uh, long time scenario. But another situation we have to consider about is what these kind of uh, graduates with a master or a PhD degree, they can contribute to the development of the industry. Because I think if the work involves the high tech or they can use the high tech to upgrade or to optimize different kind of occupations, then a graduate with a higher degree will definitely contribute. So that means the kind of the nature of these positions are actually changing. So that is not labor intensive, but actually intellect driven or intellect intensive. So during this process, those graduates with more knowledge or even higher degree, they can go to those kind of positions that we traditionally think they won't go there, but finally they can actually promote and help the industry to, up, to upgrade as well as to contribute its development in the future. Okay, very well said. So, um, Giovanni, uh, what about in uh, the situation in Brazil? Because just now you said, um, I guess you do not have this overeducated issue because uh, there are not many people who has this uh, bachelor's degree, but um, what kind of jobs do young people prefer in your country? Do they want to go so to factories? So yeah, like uh, hearing all this and like, especially from the tone of this, uh, this specialist, uh, I, I'm talking from a Brazilian point of view, right? Which is a little pessimistic, I think, <laughs> compared to, to all the other people here in this panel. But uh, this, uh, these specialists have like a uh, perspective of these students, these graduates, they have a choice, right? That you can choose like whether to wait to, to go to a fact, uh, to go to a, a job that you want, or like, oh, maybe I'll just go to a factory there because there I can earn some money, right? In Brazil, mm -hmm. we don't have a choice, right? <laughs> In Brazil, like you either you don't go and find a first job. <laughs> no, I mean, you don't have a choice for doing your, your the work you study for, right? Uh -huh. uh, much probably you have to like grab the first job you, you find, the first job opportunity you find and use it for as long as possible so you can have income for your house, for your family. So like <laughs> uh, having a choice is still a little far away for, for Brazilian people. Okay. Or at least like for people that has less money. I see. Um, so, Rion, can you tell us more about the situation in your country, in South Africa? Yes. Um, so, in South Africa, we obviously we're not a manufacturing intensive economy. So, unlike, for example, Russia and South Africa and China, um, which have these factories, you can tell you that people work in the factories. In South Africa, you can't tell you that because there are no factories. But what the government has been doing, um, and which has been sort of the approach is vocational training in the sense of if you teach someone, for example, a technical skill, which as we've said, does not require a highly academic qualification. It's just a technical skill like such as welding, um, such as uh, plumbing, such as electrician work. These things can be done with your hands. So it's a similar kind of work you would do in a factory, but it empowers these young people to go out and actually uh, you know, use these skills because in the conversation about going, and I mean, I, I, obviously that expert, I'm, I guess, is speaking from a Chinese context, but for South African and South African youth, the big problem is not just, uh, one of the problems is, as Giovanni mentioned as well in Brazil, is that you just have to grab the first job that comes your way. Um, and for most people in South Africa, unfortunately, for most youth, that is usually a very uh, low skilled job that does not allow any upward mobility. So for example, you're gonna work on a farm picking fruit, you're going to go pack bricks on a building site, nothing that will ever like allow you to grow as an individual and, and develop other kinds of skills. Um, and the problem with that is that unless we can get to a point where young people can produce generational wealth, 
because essentially that's what happened in China. And I, I'm speaking from my own from my own sort of reading and studying here. So if any Chinese in the room want to correct me, but a few generations ago, uh, the Chinese today are on average wealthier than than your grandparents and their grandparents. And that's because of the economic changes that happened and the new opportunities that, that came along. But it's also because you were able to build generational wealth. Each generation was a little bit wealthier and a little bit better off than the one before. Whereas in South Africa, it's generation after generation after generation, they stay at the same economic level. So the idea is that Why whatever is that? we do- What do you think are the problems? Well, as I said, the fact that most people, for example, if your your grandfather was working on a farm picking grapes, you will work on a, on a farm picking grapes, your son will work on a farm picking grapes. Yes, so there's no like upward mobility. So I don't know if the go work in the factory approach will work in China, but in South Africa, I think our people are already doing labor intensive, low skilled work. What we need is a ladder up and to provide that ladder so they can move to the next level and build generational wealth. Okay, so I think the situation in China is that um, with the development of the economy or, or the technology, we are actually creating a lot of new jobs in, in this country. And of course, there are also new problems coming out. For example, um, with the development of e-commerce, uh, a growing number of young people, they are uh, choosing to become delivery men, uh, express delivery or in food delivery. Uh, however, an expert, another expert, I mean, I, I'm really not a fan of those experts, but <laughs> this is really a hot topic online. And he suggested that um, young people should go to your, uh, factories instead of uh, becoming a delivery man because he said um, this will lead to deindustrialization because there won't be enough uh, people working in manufacturing. So uh, Chen Xi, what do you think? Does he have a point? I mean, delivery men no. are also important. Without delivery men, who are going to buy your manufacturing products, right? Yeah, that's true. So uh, to work in factory or delivery, that's a question. But that, that is actually a question about you know, the industry as well, whether we should choose the production industry or the, you know, the service industry. So this is kind of the transformation of the economic structure we are having right now in China. So kind of like starting from the uh, 1990s, we're kind of like like developed from the uh, manufacturing e economy to the kind of the service economy. So there was a kind of uh, voice where a kind of uh, view that uh, the service industry will finally replace the manufacturing industry, but I won't agree with uh, this kind of ideas. And at the same time, we should we should kind of understand that this, this is kind of situation, not only in China, but also in, in many different countries around the world, because they have a kind of the shrinking uh, manufacturing industry, but a, you know, a, a very big proportion of the uh, service industry in, in the national economy. But in China, what is uh, quite special or unique is the, this kind of uh, delivery industry or the delivery service is quite unique in China because we used to say that uh, China has a very huge manufacturing economy so at this time if we are choosing if we are choosing to go to the service industry and you know totally let this let, let the service pushed out the manufacturing that won't be the most suitable case here in, in china for example if we have you know less employees in factory then the delivery will be oversupplied and the same thing applies to you know if we have two if we have less delivery uh, service employees but more in the uh, factory so in order to rationalize the kind of the economic pattern as well as the industrial pattern so in china's case we have to have the government now get on to the stage to kind of balance the different economy or the industries between the manufacturing and also the, 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 the service industry. So I think that's the uh, kind of the case in China. We need both to develop the manufacturing industry as well as to develop the uh, service economy. So yeah, that's okay, it. Okay, but it's hard balance to make, right? So yeah. Amartya, uh, would you like to talk about the situation in India? Because India is also strong in manufacturing, but do you also have this deindustrialization trend? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I frankly, I'm not very educated on this issue. So I, I don't think I would be able to give something very insightful on this particular topic. Okay, I see. We'll have you talk more on other issues. Uh, so sure. Giovanni, um, what about the situation in Brazil? I mean, um, 
do people like to work in delivery industry? I'm not sure about yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, first, like, talking about that deindustrialization thing, right? Because in Brazil, actually, like, we're suffering a deindustrialization process, right? Um, industry is like manufacturing and like transformation um, in industry is like only about uh, 10, 11 percent of the Brazilian GDP, right? Uh, so this uh, this um, industry, like the industrialization, is something that comes from our government support, right? If the government doesn't support the industry, like we don't have like a bigger industry, and maybe we don't have like um, more jobs for for in this in this area, right? So we cannot just say like our oh, young people should choose to go to to industry jobs to to increase the industry, right? This is like it's an, inv an inverted uh, inverted thinking, right? And then in the other side, which is like a totally unrelated matter, is the the delivery industry. I don't know in other countries, but in Brazil, you can be associated with like these delivery apps or with driving like those like Uber, right? Uh, without any uh, commitment to the company, right? You don't have any formal uh, bond with that company, which makes like, this is just like basically an informal job with like people can, can uh, how to say, can find you by their phone, right? But you don't have like any working rights and, and et cetera. So it's basically just like a technological way of, of how to say, increasing informal jobs. And we're actually, Brazil is, is trying to do some some legalization on that, but it's already like three or four years that doesn't have much progress, actually. Okay, so, I know, but, but I, I heard I, that actually many young people in Latin America, uh, be it Brazil, Argentina, uh, they would want to go to another country to find a job, right? Yeah, well, this actually happens a lot, and mostly in, in people that are more educated, right, they, they feel like, oh, okay, I can actually find some opportunities abroad and earn more money. Like I have an example in my house, my, my brother, when he was like about like 18, 19 years old, he came to my mom and said like, oh, I want to go to the United States. You can help me with the tickets. Like, oh, well, what you're going to do? And, and he said like, I'm going to do some gardening. Uh, I'm going to clean chimneys. <laughs> and like, I'm going to earn lots, lot more money that I, I were here in Brazil with a qualified job. And she said, like, well, if you want to do gardening, just do it at home. I, I can pay for you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, in the end, she said, like, you know, uh, you want to do this kind of thing. And I, I don't agree. I give you the ticket for going, but no, I'll never pay for you to come back. And then he decided to stay in Brazil and, and just do it, his normal career here. I mean, yeah, there. find a job in Brazil, right? Yeah, works as salesman. So uh, what I want to say is that maybe uh, emerging economies uh, like Brazil, uh, the government should think of how to create more jobs in, in your country so that young people do not have to travel such a long distance to make a living. And by the way, I have to say with the rise of populism, some developed countries like the US, um, they are not so friendly to immigrants, although immigrants play an important role in their country. True. So, uh, do you think um, so, um, Giovanni? I'm sorry, what, what's the question? I mean, what do you think the government should do something to create more jobs at home so that young people do not have to travel to another country to make a living? Well, to be honest, in Brazil, I think that the most uh, we are uh, lacking of structure uh, or of a structured like plan to increase it to, I would say, to improve our economy. Right? We should have more diversity. Brazil right now doesn't invest in in science and technology, uh, it doesn't invest in other industries. Like we are just uh, doing uh, exportation of primary products, which is like a very low tier way of earning money, right? As a as a big country. So while Brazil doesn't have like a re uh, reform in their like working in their industries in their investments, we are gonna keep like this situation forever in a closed loop. Yes. Um, so when we talk about those manufacturing works, um, there's also another thing that we haven't mentioned. It is about the development of AI technology. Um, there's um, a, a report by China's Center for International Knowledge on development. And it said uh, between 2020 to 2025, around 850 million jobs will be replaced by machines. 
So I mean, how many jobs will be left in factories by then? So um, Rion, maybe you can um, share some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that's, that, that really is the issue. Um, because when, when countries in Africa and South Africa look, for example, at the experience of countries like China, uh, what we see is over the last few decades, actually probably as, as um, was mentioned in the last, probably in the 19th century, was this industrialization driven by a, a labor intensive you know, production process. And there was a time when China produced low quality products and then exported them and then the quality of the products increased and increased and i mean now china is exporting you know the, the world's technology and the world's like top all those kind of things and so when african countries look at this they say well we can do that too because we now have a large population the majority of this population is young we can also do labor intensive manufacturing and use that as a way to you know position ourselves in the global uh, production chain because at the moment where we are in the, in the global production chain is at the very bottom. Like all the raw materials are coming from Africa, they're being exported from Africa, gold, platinum, diamonds, everything. But and then it gets sent to another country and it gets resold to us at a high, much, much higher price, and it's not a very good deal for us. And so Africa's intention is very much to climb the the, the supply chain and the production chain, but with the introduction of AI and sort of manufacturing. Um, that, that really stops it because a machine can work faster, well, at least as the machines evolve, they can work faster, they can work cheaper. Um, and this really threatens, I think, the, the stability of the global economy because in the end, if regions like Africa, and like Latin America, cannot follow the same path as, as uh, more developed developing countries, like for example, China and Russia, or even the developed world, then the global economy will at some point, I think, Reach, reach a sort of critical point. So it's something that really needs to be considered in policies and in BRICS. Yes. Um, so Artem, um, what do you think? Do you think we should be worried that our jobs will be replaced by machines? Because theoretically speaking, if uh, productivity increases, then we can have more time to relax or enjoy our life and still have a high standard of living. I mean, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by 2030, we will only have to work 15 hours a week and still have a high living standard. But I mean, something must be wrong with that theory. So Artem, what do you think? Um, I look at this quite positive, I think. Like, I mean, like if you go back to like 18th, 19th century, when they salute it in England, it was like uh, trying to break all these machines, like they take their jobs. I mean, like it's, it's, I mean, like, you, you told by yourself that now a lot of delivery guys, who knew, like, 20 years ago that, like, uh, China need millions of delivery guys, right? So, I mean, like, there's always new fields. And when we are very developed, let's say, like, all developed countries uh, has a lot of issues with, like, uh, uh, like, suicides, for example. Quite, I mean, like, people have a lot of free times. They need, like, psychotherapists. So we need, like, millions of people who will take care of, like, our mental health. For example and like we need to increase our lives right uh, to then we need more doctors so i mean like there's a lot of i mean like if economy is free it's fine i mean like the same for like china why, why, why you need to worry about like uh okay not many people go to factories yeah then like uh owners of manufacturer uh, they will think about how to increase the robotization of the production right I mean, like, uh, if there is not many regulations, if you let economy be, uh, I mean, like, at least, like, mostly free, so it will find a way. I think it's, it's nothing to worry about. Okay, so uh, there will, some people will lose their jobs, but at the same time, new jobs will be created. Is that what you mean? So... Yes, for sure. I mean, like, that's, what, that's what's happening right now. I mean, like all these delivery guys, they were uh, factory workers before. M many of them, but or like many of factory they workers, be replaced by AIs. Mm, then well, it will be something new. Then, okay. then it will be something new. Someone need to okay. go and check these AIs. I mean, like how delivery thing will be replaced after two hundred years? Till two hundred years, we will have much more and other jobs. I think. Uh, what, what, what should people do, right? Okay, so Amartya, would you like to say something about this? 
uh, i have nothing new to add on this i think um what i'm what i could add here is that i don't think i think we look at it wrong if we think about it as a employment problem i think this is still a skill and education problem because um uh the the you know uh, having ai doesn't mean jobs are being destroyed it means that you need different kind of skills in the new economy so the main problem is not that jobs are being lost the main problem is how can you train your workforce to deal with this shift okay so giovanni would you agree so i think automation is not a problem automation is a solution right like we should see automation as a thing that will improve our life quality right like you're taking away like those uh very dangerous jobs that people would maybe get hurt or die as very easily and putting robots on it like this is a good thing right or like increasing the production of like some some products that we use every day without having to make people waste their times inside those factories actually this is a good thing the 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 problem is like how we shape the society around it right so uh we don't think about like redu- uh, redistributing the the income like how to make people for example have less time working we don't need to put every human working at like 40 to 50 hours a week if we can automate most of this process we can like just work less and like have more free time to work our creat- creativity or like just be humans right i think this is the, the best thing about um about automation but we need to think about the society around yeah i think what you Sorry? mentioned is an ideal situation but the thing is um let me give an example because uh, we have many young bosses in this panel right uh, for example if now we can do 400 people's job by using only 200 people and now as a boss you will have two options one you can uh, choose to still hiring these 400 people and let them work less for example only two or three days a, w- a week and then you can get the still amount of profit but what often happen is that you're going to fire 200 people and let the others work even harder that's what the bosses True. usually do right so correct me if i'm wrong no you're right actually this is the approach that people will have when you have profit as the main thing in your society right So that's the the thing that we need to stimulate like this kind of change in society we need to stimulate like to see things in a more human way and less uh, like towards profit and this so far right now the only way we can change that is through like regulation like this is something that I I kind of disagree with Arden is like we need to regulate more this kind of industries to make sure that uh, the workers are act- actually having enough rights for them because if you leave everything free the bosses will just like make everything as much as possible to increase their profits and just like don't care about their workers is it a problem of capitalism i don't know but artem <laughs> uh you are a, a boss yourself right so are you going to fire the 200 people or are you going to let them work less but i don't want I mean like what kind of uh, industry when you like changing your business model so fast then you need to fire 200 people usually it happens like you have some problems like economic crisis right it's still a process i mean like maybe i will decrease my uh, number of my employees in like next 5 years so it still be like one by one if i decide to do like this but then i mean like for sure i pay enough compensation because this is a law so it won't be like like suddenly 200 unemployed people on the street it won't be like this for sure the first thing the second thing you always even in our company we are checking like our employees coming like on one position and maybe after one year if you like take care about them like if you have a proper hr you can uh, switch them to totally another position so you the most uh, like uh, important thing now for all businesses even for big corporation to be flexible in this world right you be flexible so and that's why uh, now the main thing for your employee the main feature is not actually education you just being smart and being flexible and being able to learn something new like now and really that's how we hire people now it's not about like you have diploma of this 
I mean, like smart person. I mean, like as we have in Russian sound like proverb, like the talented person, talented in every field, in each field. So like if you're talented in one, you probably will be talented. I don't uh, speak about like very narrow niche, like uh, like medical workers or something like this. But in uh, most things like in the business, I think like it's easy to switch if you're smart enough. You see, if you cannot uh, be smart enough and you're not flexible enough, sorry, you'll be fired. So learn to be flexible. <laughs> I think you are really good at doing business. So, Chen Xi, let me go to you because uh, there's another trend in China now called lying flat or tangping in Chinese that young people, they would like to live a less ambitious or less materialistic life. And this is not unique in China because in the US, we also have this anti-work culture or the great resignation. So what do you think could be the reasons behind this trend? Yeah, as we just mentioned uh, by several guests here, that uh, if we have AI industries, then it's kind of a signal telling us that we have to upgrade not only our industry as well as our kind of the education. We have to, you know, the, the, uh, there, there will be some kind of the generational change for young people. They will choose to study technology-related um, majors instead of uh, the other, you know, traditional um, kind of majors we 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 tend to um, tend to choose, but at the same time, we all mentioned that we need government to kind of balance different industries as well as the kind of uh, development among different. Like companies or, or industry and also that is that, that is exactly the reason why we have the BRICS uh, mechanism as we can shoot different you know the experiences of uh, development in different countries we can find something that we share the same so we can learn from each other and we can find a solution to the problem and at the same time we have to say that for young people they will contribute most to the society and the country's development so they cannot just lie flat directly. So by saying the lie, by saying uh, you know lying flat, I, I think as you just mentioned, this is not the kind of the unique phenomenon in China only. In the United States, as well as in other countries, there are the kind of a phenomenon as well. I I kind of like opt to think that uh, this might because um, like we have a we have a very you know fast developed uh, economy as well as very good social welfare, so there won't be enough uh, you know incentives for 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 young people. So this is the kind of the name that they are calling themselves. So the kind of the uh, the, the phenomenon we we we, we have uh, seen before, but we are creating the kind of a new name for that. But at the same time, we have to know that um, there will always be pressure you know for young generation and for every country. So we can't just uh, talk indirectly and do nothing. Uh, at the same time, I think this kind of a uh, saying, the tomping or lying flat, is a kind of a euphemism for 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 young people. You know, to to say it in a very uh, jokey way, so they are doing a kind of a self mockery or uh, self deprecating. But that doesn't mean that they are actually having an indifferent attitude towards their life. But they are paying more attention to the psychological health instead of uh, pursuing the economic materialism only. So maybe after a relaxed holiday or vacation, you know, tomorrow will be another new day. So we have to work hard still. I see. So Rion, uh, what about the situation in your country? Are people also lying flat? So I wouldn't say that, that people are necessarily lying flat, but I think there is a trend where people are becoming more dissatisfied with certain kinds of work. Um, and some kinds of work environments. Uh, like, for example, myself, if I was to take myself as an example, the industry that I work in outside of my civil society is the education technology. Um, and we do remote work. So we work remotely completely. And among that sort of group of, of young people working in that sector, there's general consensus amongst us that we would like to continue working remotely because it gives us freedom, it gives us a unique perspective and a way to live our lives. Um, and we're not bound to the same kind of you know office nine to five job that our, our our parents and their parents were bound to. Um, so on the phenomenon of the lying flat, I mean I, I'm not going to be to claim that I, I can diagnose the issue in, in China or in America, but having had experience with both these societies and their work cultures, I think both of their work cultures are very toxic. Um, I'm generalizing here, but I think as a rule, if you compare it to, for example, a place like South Africa. 
I mean, you speak to Americans or, or Chinese and you ask them things about their work environment and they would be startled, you know? Like to take an example, the, the issue of holidays. Um, when I was working in China, when you take a holiday, uh, or for, for example, a national holiday, you have to work back the day, you know, at some other point, at least in the industry where I was, you have to work it back. And as a South African, I was like, but it's a holiday. We support, like in South Africa, we take our holidays very seriously. And I think that leads back to um, the sheet point in terms of the young people, I think, want a more balanced life. They want to consider other things. They want to have time to spend with their families, to, to pursue their hobbies, um, to do things that enrich them as human beings and not just be expected to be, you know, robots at work 24 7. And so I feel like governments really need to meet young people at that level and realize that they're not just being, you know, naughty children. They actually have priorities and a vision for their life that they feel is not being expressed in the kind of way society works right now. And then just one point that I want to make on that is that linking back to the previous discussion we had on AI and those kind of things, I think the key there is, is innovation. And if young people can be led to become more innovative, and if they can, if government can create spaces and regulate spaces where young people can actually innovate and take what they want for their lives and, and monetize it make, it, make it profitable. Like for example, if we look at social media, we didn't think, uh, I think uh, Artem, you were, you were the one who mentioned it, we didn't think 10, 20 years ago that today people would be making money and making a living of being YouTubers or being, you know, on, on, on TikTok and these places. And they are. And that is innovation meeting uh, a, a sort of a way to make a living. Um, and so I feel like we need to create more of those spaces uh, to really diagnose and, and address this issue of, of so-called lying flat um, because our generation wants something different. Okay, I see. So Armartia, just now Rion mentioned about this toxic work cultures because you are working as an employee um, in Xiaomi. Uh, that's a tech company in China, right? So I'm wondering how, how is your company treating you? Are they treating you well? Is, is Mr. Lei a nice guy? Uh, I think instead of, getting into, instead of getting into those details, I think what's really interesting here is those uh, themes that you can hear in what Shanshi has said as well as what uh, Rion has said. Um, I think some there are two or three common themes. Uh, they've already mentioned it um, just to kind of go over those things. I think, first of all, I think as young people, we really, uh, well, I say we because I think most of us want this, okay? We want growth opportunities. Uh, most of us would not be satisfied if we feel that we are doing the same thing over and over for years. Um, we don't, we prefer growth over safety, I think most mostly. Um, the second thing is that um, I think we want balance in work and life that uh, is, is very hard to always just be uh, kind of, you know, a 24 hours a day just doing one thing. I think uh, as Rion was mentioning, people have aspirations, people have dreams, people are more complete humans. So I think the third thing that it comes down to is, um, and this is, I, I'm not singling out uh, China or India or South Africa. I think this is pretty much global now that um, people talk about this whole, you know, like, okay, millennials, Gen Z, you guys are such a problem. You guys are such a headache uh, because you have too many demands. You have too much, too many unrealistic expectations. What's unrealistic about this? We want to be treated like humans. We want balance in work and life, and we want growth. I think is quite reasonable. Well said. Well said. Um, so yeah. I mean, actually, for some people who are tired of working for a boss as an employee, they actually want to start their own business. And we have uh, several young entrepreneurs here uh, in this panel. So, Artem, do you want to give them some some suggestions? I would say you better try. I mean, like, why? Why you are young? I, I mean, like, you have nothing to lose, right? You can start this with some small, I don't know, small company. Even like with your friends, two, three people. I mean, like, even you fail, you will understand. Is it yours or no? Because I mean, like, by statistics, it's all about like this Instagram and like you know this life. You're an entrepreneur. You have a lot of 
money and everything like but actually you're like busy like 24 and 7 and actually if you compare with like i'm 32 now like if you compare the friends who got to like a big corporate like xiaomi or something like 12 years ago now all they're all like very high position they have like their vacations they have like i mean like in cash it's more money usually like by just by statistics like in your pocket there are more cash if you are in, have a stable good work and you're a good uh, worker so it's more about like you're working in the future and it's more about like uh, taking a risk i mean like we would be you are one of these like 10 entrepreneurs who like build very successful company or you are one of these like 50 who will fail or will you will be average work a lot but uh, like paying even like sometimes employees more money than to yourself so it's just like about like your choice i mean like it's nothing very romantic and cool to be entrepreneur it's also cool to be a good engineer it's also cool to be a general manager of another company i mean like it's just about like your choice yes i i, I do agree but do you think it is a good time to start your business because you are doing now, your business in shanghai right it's i mean like in our countries for sure pandemic i mean like if you find oh, yeah it's not easy in pandemic exactly but i mean like uh, actually in emerging countries because like we are growing i mean like uh, you if you choose the right right field you're growing together i mean like it's it's just like a, a role of the business right you choose the field which is growing and even even you will do like very average not like something like super uh, good results you will be grow with this field together so just like make it uh, sustainable uh, yeah i think like it's a, it's a good time like before COVID, I mean, like, but now uh, COVID time, I mean, like, getting better, I think. So I, I still think it's a good time, especially okay. in, for sure. If you want to set up your business, you look for emerging economies, right? Okay. Uh, but Giovanni uh, may not agree with you because Giovanni, you used to be a boss, right? But now you are an employee. <laughs> <laughs> what makes yeah. you change? Well, it's just about the opportunity, right? Like uh, before in Brazil, I actually had two, two jobs at the same time, right? I, I worked as a software software developer in the in the day, and then I would work in my my own business, which be would, would be my my martial art gym gym that night. And uh, well, at at that time was exactly my dream. It was like to go out of this thing of being an employee, right? I, I took away my money, I took away my time, like it was a very stressful time, but it was my, my way of trying to run away from this, like being an employee thing. And then when the, the, the opportunities came to China arrives, well, I thought this was the best thing for me and I, I just like left everything behind, came to China to do my master's degree. And here I just realized that uh, being an employee is the best way for me to like cope with my objectives, right? To, <laughs> To stay in China. So for now, as staying in China and opening a company is not exactly as easy as it is in Brazil. I just for now I'm, I'm doing this employee. And I, I want to add, like in Brazil it's super easy to, to open a company, right? If you have like your your documents like normal, you, you don't have any problems with law, you just like do a requirement on the internet, go um, on an official place and, and put a stamp on it, you're a company, right? And you pay like less than ten dollars a day uh, a month for for maintaining it, which is like a way that Brazilian government actually uh, trying to to take these informal people and make make them informal workers. <laughs> so okay. lots of people are just like making making them small business, like becoming like real business. I see. Um, I think you but, made a very. Uh, sorry, you can anyone say. want to add something? No, just saying that this doesn't help uh, people like to break the inequality barrier, right? Just <laughs> keep their, their jobs at the same line. Okay. But still, they're but I, entrepreneurs. I, I think you, yes, I think you do mention a point um, that um, in emerging economies, it's kind of easier to start your business. It's not like in countries like the US, where all industries are being um, in the hands of this very few giants. So, uh, Chen Xi, let me ask you this. Um, do you think um, the governments in emerging economies should also do some, something to support these startups? Or do you feel maybe we can do something under the, the BRICS framework? 
Yeah, uh, well, I think because uh, we Chinese people always say that the, the best time to, to, to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time as well. So if we are going to, uh, you know, start our business, own business, we actually are really having a lot of good policies currently in China. For example, in Shanghai as a you know major global business hub with a kind of the thriving startup scene. So this Shanghai is actually home to many, you know, uh, entrepreneurial programs here. And we have a lot of uh, like startup accelerators as well as incubators here in Shanghai. So um, I know that uh, there are certain kind of the policies that is especially targeted the college students who are encouraged by the government and the society to start their own business. So they are enjoying the kind of uh, I think the early stage support policies that could be given by the government, for example, maybe under the same con conditions that students from uh, certain universities, they will be given priority in starting business and to enter into the, you know, incubators park. And also sometimes they will be granted 100% rent subsidies for up to two years. And also they might be exposed exempt from uh, maybe you know, the industry or the commercial tax, as well as other regulations or administrative fees, things like that. So I think, uh, at least in China here, the country is actually providing a lot of good policies for people who would like to start their uh, own business. And also, if we are talking this under the, you know, the, the, the BRICS mechanism, we can actually uh, exchange our experiences and we can have a discussion like this between uh, entrepreneurs and as well as uh, between, you know, different, you know, administrative uh, policies or, or something like that. So we can exchange our idea and to see which would be a better path that we could pursue in the future if we would like to start our own business. Okay, thank you, Chen Xi. I think we had a really interesting discussion today. I hope we can talk more, but uh, the time is really limited. But um, thank you, Chen Xi. Thank you, Giovanni, Artem, Amartya, Rion, and uh, Hokkien left early, but still, thank you, Hokkien. And thank you all for being with us today. And for those who are watching us, I hope you have enjoyed our discussion and I hope everyone good luck in your study and in your work. Um, and I hope next time we can meet in person. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>